Uh, some years ago, I spoke to Dr. Nakshin Wadia, who was the professor of neurology and whom I knew from my student days at the Grant Medical College in JJ Hospital and asked him if he would uh, let me interview him on his early years as a student at the Grant Medical College. And his first response was that, yes, very happy to do that, but why don't you interview my teacher, uh, Professor Saraya? I was startled by the fact that when Dr. Wadia was approaching 90, he still had a teacher who would be active and capable of giving an interview. I did the interview with Dr. Wadia, and then I went on to interview Dr. Saraya at the age of 97. And this snowballed into a project where I continuously found and tracked down people who were professors at the Grant Medical College and JJ and had served on the staff for many years and spoke to them about their experiences at the Grant Medical College in every aspect, teaching, their early life in Bombay, their trips to England, their coming back, the famous personalities that they interacted with, their professors, the people who inspired them, what happened uh, at Grant Medical College during the Freedom Movement, when the dock explosion took place in 1944, etc., etc. It's taken time. It's taken me maybe about two or three years to get a whole series of interviews together. And there has been pressure because sadly, many of the professors that I've interviewed have uh, subsequently passed on. Even Dr. Noshirwadia is unfortunately no longer with us. And with this race against time, we've covered many of the people who were in their 90s. Dr. Saraya recently celebrated his 100th birthday and is still going strong. And now I'm going to be turning in a second uh, series of interviews to people who are in their 80s to tell me about what life was like in uh, Grant Medical College and JJ in the 40s and the 50s. I hope you enjoy this. It's been fabulous fun for me. I've uh, looked forward to it constantly and uh, I've been very excited about finding new people to talk to about uh, aspects of Grant Medical College and uh, JJ Hospital. And uh, I'm going to keep this process going for no other reason than the fact that I'm having great fun doing it. And I came to Bombay in 1948. And Swarabji, I was a lost man. Why was that? The whole thing had changed, the whole life had changed. Till I came to Bombay, I had not worn shoes. Come on, sir. Really? College and Ferguson? I used to go with lenga and half shirt. Really? I had never taken food on a table. I used to sit down and take food. Mm -hmm. So, you can imagine, it's a big change. Mm -hmm. You may laugh at me in Pula first of all, eh? I used to go with an ink, ink bottle in my hand. Pen were not there. Mm -hmm. I had never seen a tram. I was born in a Marathi atmosphere, both Belgao and P -P 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 Puna. People going in traps, having wristwatches on their hands. Uh, people look very smart. Mm. Their clothes were very interesting. Mm. I had never seen a telephone. Can you believe it? No, so one day I told my friend who was staying with me that you go to new hostel. Mm. I'll give you a ring from here to new hostel. I had that time force were free. Still remember that exciting period, I phoned my friend and he could talk with me. <laughs> what made you decide you wanted to do medicine? That was when I was eight years old. Eight years old? Yes. Mm. What happened was our cook, mm. she wanted to put something on the uh, sleep and uh, she fell down. Mm. And she fell in the uh, big vessel which contained boiling milk. Oh my goodness. Mm. And then she was all the time asking for water, party, 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 like that. Mm. So I was giving her water mm. all the time, mm. but she was not feeling well. Mm. By that time, of course, the doctor came. Mm. He came and gave her some injection. Mm. And then she cried. Mm. So I said, Mm. With that, I gave her so much water, she was not happy. Mm. And with that one injection, she became happy. Mm. So, that is the doctors can stop pain. Mm. Mm. So, I should become a doctor. How lovely. Mm. It, was, it was inside me, I wanted to do service. You know, very high quality, I do service to humanity. Mm. All that business inside me. And I was interested in serving the suffering people 
remove their woes and difficulties and make them happy. That became the aim of my life. And uh, so I decided not to become an engineer, become a medical doctor so that I can serve the society much uh, better. When I reached about 12, 13, 14, I think, and we had a big dining table. It's interesting what we did on a dining table. On the dining table, you would study. My uh, Jimmy, my the one, Jalbe was 13, 14, 15 years senior to go. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I was 19, 25, mm. and he was 19, 12. So he, we looked up to him as a big man, and he was a already in Xavier's College playing cricket mm. and very famous, yes, yes, very wow. famous and very famous, yes. So, we were there and on the table we sit there, Jimmy uh, at the head, myself and Behram studying. After we finished the studies, we would eat on that table. On the dining table? No, no. And if some guests came, one of us had to sleep on the dining table. Early in the morning, they bring a whip mm. and everybody has to get a whip, don't they, they hit you. Really? Beat you with it. The and then um, there were no toilets enough. So they take us march down into the fields with the army men so next so to us. What age would you have been at that time? It must be four or five years old. That's all. So from yeah. four or so five years old. I only remember my this Gurukul. And, just so and, and in holidays would you go back to family somewhere? <laughs> no, no. Gurukul means you're not supposed to meet anybody. Oh, really? No holidays, nothing. It's, I, I told you, it's like a, really speaking, like a prison. And for how many years? Seven, seven and a half years. Wow. Twenty years. We never have seen a house, never went out. And Amazing. I don't know, I have not seen my new father, stepfather. Mm. Mother also, I don't know. Would she come to visit? Sometimes. Well, she came. Two, three times because the fees, they won't send the fees regularly. Uh -huh. If they don't fees, send the fees regularly, mm. <clears throat> then immediate next to the or very common ward, there was an orf orphanage. Mm. If your fees don't come, they'll send us to the orphanage. My goodness. Orphanage, we had to sleep on the ground with all snakes around. Yeah. Very very good. And we come back to my father, my brother, who always thought that I was a, in Gujarati, Darpo. <laughs> you know, somebody who liked to, So I said, look, I must toughen myself. Uh, within a few days, uh, it was very obvious that the teachers at the Grand Medical College were excellent teachers. I had to go to the college by tram. Uh, Ten Nambani tram. From where? Uh, I was staying on this uh, Nepianchi Road. Uh, 23 Nepianchi Road. Right. That was not the building now, that is down, gone now. Uh, Small building. Walk down to Goala Tank ah. and from Goala Tank go to Geja Hospital by tram, ah. spending a huge sum of 10 paisa. <laughs> so, At the same time that you were there, hmm. there were many Talwalkar cousins as well who were in, in the campus. Together with me were uh, two of them, yes. and senior to me were three of them. Yes. So, it was a good family bonding in yes. that sense. <laughs> You didn't need to ever buy textbooks. No. <laughs> <laughs> and but did you find uh, exams difficult? Lot of studies to do. I don't know. I never studied more. Till today, I don't read more. But how I have become FRCS, I don't know. And restrictions started. How did you find that? That was very difficult. Oh, uh, uh, to inter science, somebody used to show us the dissection and mm. then we did the mm. Here nobody showed. Mm. We, my partner read it from Caligaps mm. and uh, I dissected or I read it from Caligaps and CBC. Mm. But it was very difficult to start dissecting a human body. Mm. Because I used to feel all the time that who is this man? Mm. And who were his parents? What was he doing in his life? Did he have wife and children or no? How did he die like this? Mm. Because he was a roadside kid. Mm. 
and uh, I just felt like not doing any music for me. Mm. But then once I started, mm. they told us I I got the left upper extremity, and we were told that you start from the palm because mm. the palm the structures mm. they get dry. Mm. So I started from the palm mm. and then I dissected the palm mm. and understood the arid beds mm. that when bed mm. I was so surprised mm. that I wanted to find out how all these arid beds were made. Then the dissection was easy. was easy. First our entrance into the college. The senior student used to harass the junior student. <laughs> so they will come. Generally, they are in Aram Bhat hostel. Come down to the old hostel and harass the. Old. We were a very sort of militant people. I say we will challenge them. Let them come. So we also organized a group. And when they came, we were shouting slogan. And so well prepared, so they were pushed back for the first time in the history and they had to run away. And those days people who got 50 per mask got admission. In those days, there were only 20 people with first class in whole part. Of Bombay Presidency. For Presidency. And mm -hmm. I had, though I was a very average student, I was 58 per cent mask, so I walked in. I was 18 when I got in medical, 1943, in medical college, I, I must say, I got lost. Mm. It was so big, it took me three days to get the topography of the place. Where is physiology, where is anatomy. I was used to Xavier's college and Xavier's school and building. Mm. And here you walk through and say, where am I, where am I? Then you turn back and you manage to get your topography there. That was two, three days. And they were imposing building, the anatomy theatre, huge, which is still there today, you know. Like an amphitheatre. Uh, fantastic. I think, you know, for a month we were tense, the freshers used to hide. And then after that, there was a big freshers welcome, where they sort of rag you publicly oh. in the anatomy hall. And I think the seniors had more fun uh, than anything else. No, I used to study in my house, huh? mostly, not in the library, because I had you had books, uh, home close so by. Those who had no books used to study in the library. But in the library I found very often that our students were studying in mixed doubles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I really don't know what they're studying. <laughs> we never want clothes, never had hair. Yeah. So a lot of freedom. When I came back, there was a rebound. <laughs> I didn't. I started keeping here and those days Devanand used to make puffs and all that. I also started making puffs because I never had hair in our life. There were other two remarkable athletes. Mm. One was Rusi Buhariwala. Mm. He was a uh, short distance uh, sprinter, 100 and 200 meters. Mm. And the other one was Ohen Pinto, mm. who was uh, middle distance and miler at 400. He is quite a famous name, isn't he? Owen Pinto? In many ways. Mm. Owen Pinto was in the national team. Mm for the relay mm. uh, along with Milka Singh oh, in Rome. He, in Rome. he was in the, in, the Olympics. in the Olympics and um, he died just last year, very recently. Really? And uh, for all these years now, he had been looking after Mother Teresa's uh, units in Bombay, right, uh, in Santa Cruz. But he participated in the Olympics when he was in Grant Medical? Or yes. Or as a GM side, yes. he participated in the Olympics? Yes, 1960. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And happy atmosphere. Oh, happy many. Great. And of course, there were lots of Parsi boys. Right. And that's where the fun started. And they're all gone now. Really? I'm so sorry about it. Yes, yes. And in the afternoon, we go to the, we would go to the uh, boys' common room. And nobody dare sit on the table where we had reserved. <laughs> the Parsi days. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Parsi bullies. <laughs> and, uh, the white, hey, Baja, ah. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And they would also, they loved us mm. and they would make fun of us, you know, Bawaji and all that. I was an outsider and, and I'll be frank with you, with a speech defect, I was a diffident boy. So you kept low key? I, I had to keep low key mm. because you could you know, ultimately remember one thing, 
to have a physical defect like stammer mm. is the biggest curse in life. Mm. So you have shy to talk. Mm. Mm. Oral exam was a terror for me. Really. Yeah. Even going and buying a ticket at railway platform was a nightmare for me. Mm. So what age did you overcome this? I don't overcome. So you are very good. No, I am supposed to be a good speaker now. Excellent. But can you believe I would go to VT mm. and write down paper what station I want to go to? Because you didn't want to we'll say talk it. because I can't talk at that time. Mm. So the stammer was much more pronounced at that. Time. Always, and to say a return was impossible. So I said, "Don, don't believe return." So the man who gave a ticket would look at me with, mm. "What a boy can't talk." Tram was good because you know why? Tram had only one ticket, <laughs> so he not ask for anything. But I have gone from VT to uh, Baikala. I tap asking for a station Dadar. Why Dadar could talk well? Mm. So I have to buy a ticket for going to JJ from VT buy a ticket in Dadar. You know, you know, people don't understand. But did you find it a big handicap in your student years? Yes. Oral What? exams are difficult. I was diffident. Mm. In final exam, in MBBS, I was good at surgery, yeah. but in, but in, but in practical, they cut down my muscles. You can't, you know. Can you imagine? One anatomy demonstrator mm. told me, mm. "Srikanthe, you can't talk two sentences well. Mm. How can you ever be a doctor in life?" Really? Yes. Very harsh. But it was taken for granted. It was. Uh... a very stimulating place to be in as a student because the teachers were superb they were all leaders in their field every one of the teachers that we had were leaders in their field uh, there is one funny incident i remember with uh, in the final mba surgical exam is there was a registrar who was very sweet and he'd show all the students the pat specimens mm-hmm. the day before <clears throat> and there were you know 60 70 pat specimens so there was really no point because it was a whole world of pathology in that But very often the examiners used to ask, okay, which uh, pick up any specimen that's on the table. So Manu Shroff, who was my classmate and is now the top uh, neuro radiologist at the uh, hospital for sick children in Toronto, uh, he had seen the specimens before. But of course, Manu, in his uh, half sleepy days, didn't realize that he had to disguise that fact. So when they said that uh, doctor pick up any specimen, he looked, and he looked, and he looked, and he looked, and he couldn't find it. So then they asked him, "Son, what are you looking for?" So he said, "Sir, there was a specimen with liver, spleen, and kidney, one slice of each in there." <laughs> so they burst out laughing. So the examiner goes down to the floor and says, "You mean this one?" So he said, "Yes, sir. I want that one." <laughs> <laughs> you know what was given when the patient was in shock? Rum and glucose. Rum and glucose. <laughs> so sister used to get a small bottle of rum, which we housemen drank. And he goes right to the patient. <laughs> I think Sareya saw through, and I was looking up to him because he was a scholar and he had come back from UK. And uh, so I said to him, "Sir, no surgery for me. Mm-hmm. I will assist you." Mm-hmm. So one day he said, "No, before you go, you must do some surgery." So I said, "All right, if you wish me to do that, I'll do it. I'll try." So. <laughs> he put me on the right side as a surgeon and he was my assistant and he asked me to do a uh, correct the retroversion of the uterus bring it forward so <laughs> i uh, was shaking all over the place and a couple of my friends were the students at that time they were watching and they said ah naswan joy you're so correct what you doing now let's see i did the right things and i put a clamp and then put some strings on it and i thought i was tying up the fallopian tube what i had done actually was tie up the knot around the forceps <laughs> and then i told saraya to release it and he could release it. he looked at, what have you done he took a knife a bit of scissors and he cut the thread said badia enough surgery for you tumhe kasti karo you will be much better tying your <laughs> kasti so please come this side and you and then finish the operation in a year they used to admit 100 students okay 80 were from our 
Bombay presidency local and 20 from were from outside according to some government regulations I don't remember now. Right. And so many used to come from East Africa. East Africa? Uh, Kampala, Nairobi and also on. From what age did you know that you wanted to do surgery? From anatomy days? Anatomy days, but first thing happens sometimes in 1950. Hmm. I was doing a casualty post. Hmm. And a boy came with a big cut over his leg. Hmm. I say, if I get this chance to do this job, hmm. I, will I will test it. So I called the CMO. Hmm. He said, sir, can I do this job? Hmm. Which year student you are? Hmm. Third year? No, no, not now. <laughs> but sir, give me a chance. Hmm. If I got difficulty, I will call you. Hmm. And he was happy. Hmm. Everybody requires some importance in life. Mm. So I say, you call it difficult, they will call you. Mm. So I thought this is my first operation in my life. Mm. And I did a job which I, on my own, say is a good job. <laughs> so I called the CMO, dress it. He had not one good word of appreciation. Mm. He, after became FRCS, really? didn't do well at all in life. Mm. But that Warbot told me, he says, uh, uh, doctor, he speaks in Marathi, uh -huh. I'm here for more than 20 years, but such a job, I don't see anybody doing it. Congratulations. You will be a good surgeon. That was my more important testimonial than my, than my FRCS. From the ward boy. What? Why? There was one more man besides me who thought I could do a good job. <laughs> I'm not joking. And these are the small successes in life with which I've grown. How were the exams? Were they very difficult? Were examiners very strict? Or would a good number pass? So many years to fail and So it was very difficult to pass at that time. It is not difficult. It is main difficult. It was main difficult. Yes. <laughs> first successful expedition of Everest, mm. India decided to send teams, mm. and the first team which went mm. had a medical doctor from JJ, okay. uh, Doctor Nana Oti, mm. who was uh, a pathologist in the pathology department. Mm. Later, he joined Hapka Institute and mm. retired from mm. there. Buses were easy, you always got place on them and, you know, things were cheap. We used to go for morning shows to Sterling Cinema and the tickets were some three bucks or two fifty and five bucks for balcony. In 72 or 73, there was a tidal wave in Andhra Pradesh mm. and whole Taluka was flooded mm. by a wave which was about 30 feet above. Wow. And uh, a friend of mine, who was a missionary, in fact a geologist missionary, who had helped develop um, uh, tube wells in Jalna hmm. and spent five years there and then hmm. had come to Bombay. Hmm. Um, his group, Christian group, hmm. had asked him if he would volunteer to go and help hmm. because they, they need the help of the geologist. So he asked me if I could send medical students, with, right. uh, interns to this. Right. So we organized this. So a series of students went from here, and for nearly three months we ran a service there. Three months. Interns from JJ went oh, along in two two week batches. What was Bombay like then? There just was not that much traffic on the road. Yeah. To drive from Napier Road where I live to Grant Medical College used to take me fifteen minutes. Uh, there were hardly any traffic lights. I used to just go up Kemp's Corner and then all the way down Grant Road. In one straight line, turn left into JJ, and I'd be there. Uh, it was basically, I think, the problem. The the problem or the advantage you can say is that there weren't any cars on the road yeah. because that was still socialist Bombay, where you had uh, only Fiat's ambassadors, standard heralds, and the waiting list for a new Fiat uh, Premier Padmini was something like six years. When they proposed the formation of a medical college. There was a lot of resistance from the government. They said, look, we've already tried to teach these natives medicine. They are incapable of teaching medicine, learning yeah. medicine. That's why the Western medical school medicine. failed. Right. That's why it failed. So it is to Sir Robert Grant's credit that he fought for it. He pushed for it. Unfortunately, by the time the sanction came from London, he, had, he was dead. And this was in actually the time of the East India Company. So it wasn't actually British India at that yeah. time. It was British India. Yes, it was, but it had actually become yeah. 
post uh, 1857. And he was what, a governor of Bombay? He was the governor of Bombay. Okay. And he really fought for, for the formation, formation of this medical college. Which is why his name is now... So the citizens right. of the city, including prominent citizens like Sir Jagannath Shankar Shet, they had a meeting at the town hall. And at the town hall meeting, they proposed the new medical college should be named after Sir Robert Grant, who had fought for it, who had struggled so hard to get it into being. And where did Jamshed Now, they come? had no money. Okay. So, the, town, the citizens of Bombay collected a certain amount of money and said, this is for the formation of the medical college. And the government matched that. And they said, okay, if you are collected so much, we'll give you so much. And the land? But they had no hospital. Okay. So, Sir Jamshed Ji, Ji Boy stepped in. And he said, I will give you the land. So he bought that land right. and gifted it to the government for the medical college and the hospital. Then the government said, we have no money for the hospital. So he said, okay, I will found the hospital and I'll give it to you, but you will have to follow certain conditions. So he laid down his conditions, which were very simple conditions. And there had to be a Parsi ward, for instance, where Parsi patients would be admitted separate from the other patients. Which is still here, there, even 150 years later, yeah. So, he was the munificent donor of a full-fledged hospital. And this was the only medical college in India at that time, which had a full-fledged, absolutely top-of-the-line hospital, hospital yeah. Yeah. attached to it. I think that's one of the things that people haven't really spoken about too much, is that there certainly was a lot of discrimination and apartheid in the early years in JJ. And the IMS officers uh, got to a certain level of seniority which ordinary Indians were not allowed to get mm, to. Mm, mm. And I remember Dr. Moose telling me, he mm. said that at one point, even the honorary's rooms were separate mm. for the whites and for the non-whites yeah. at JJ, which I thought was very shocking. <laughs> what was Charles Mohead's role in this? We hear his name a lot. He was the person who laid the foundations of the institutions that became so famous and so good. Okay, so the principal was the person who effectively ran that college. Yes. And how long would he have been there roughly? For, was he he, he was there there? from uh, 1845 to, I think, 1860. 1860. 1860. So he really sort of saw it established and up and running. Yes. But never actually realized that within the, uh, the walled campus, it was like a sort of garden-like ocean of uh, peace and tranquility, etc., which it was at that time. I would say that a large number of the structures which are extant today in Grant Medical College were not there. Old hostel as well as the Arimbat hostel, each had several messes. What did that imply? Um, there were at least four or five different groups. Hmm. A uh, Gujarati mess, hmm. a Parsi one, hmm. a Muslim one, hmm. uh, which was non-vegetarian. Hmm. Parsi was also non-vegetarian, others were um, hmm. vegetarian. Hmm. Same kind of thing in the other one too. Hmm. And you could choose which one you want to join. So you would subscribe and pay a monthly. Yeah, for the month fund you subscribe to it and then go. How many were taken in in that first batch that joined uh, Grant Medical? Ten, ten or eleven. Ten. That's it. I'll give you an instance of the eminence of this institution and of the eminence of Dr. Charles Moorhead. Somewhere around 1857 or maybe a little later, the University of London decided that the standards of medical education in England and in London in particular were very low. In fact, they were lower than the standards at the Grand Medical College and the JJ Hospital. Really? They invited Dr. Charles Moorhead to advise them on how they can raise the standards of medical education in London. How was it for women and men? Was there separate dissections? See, the boys had 70 tables on one side and the girls had three tables on the other side. And when we went for dissection, I don't know whether it was the same at your time, but uh, the males and females were divided. No, we were not. So we were not all in one room. It was a little board, uh, a little a partition. partition. Really? Where the ladies were on one side. Really? And then partition which didn't go right up to the top, so that thrilled all the boys. Every now and then we'd get parts of anatomy coming over our class. <laughs> when we joined, the girls never went alone to the canteen. They were always accompanied by boys. Really? Then we said that we go to Irani hotels for boys for buying chocolates and this and that. 
Then why do we require anybody to accompany us with that mm. reward? Mm. So why not we go on our own? On So just the two of us, we went. Mm. We went. So everybody was looking at us because there were <laughs> boys and girls. There were boys and girls, but no, no two girls. girls no. So we went, we sat there, we had some drink and uh, papers and all that, gave drink and everything and came out. So one girl came and she said, where is your escort? Escort? Her escort. Hmm. So I said, she is my escort and I am her escort. <laughs> so she said, this, this is not allowed. Huh. Uh, she was a senior girl. Hmm. This is not allowed. Then my partner said, we do not know any boys hmm. and we will not like boys to pay for us also. Hmm. That's what she said. Right. Uh, Very nice. Uh, hmm. And from that time the girls started, started going on their own. The dock has occurred in 1944. Right. I think. Uh, yes, 44. In the evening at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, I was going to my consulting rooms near Opera House. There was a huge sound. Yeah. And we thought, I didn't know, I thought something has happened or what has happened to here or what. But that ship had blown up. Mm. And there were so many admissions to the JJ Hospital. In those days, Shankar Mehta organized and worked like hell. Huh? Mm. Really, I can't. Imagine any doctor working like that morning and night and organizing the mm. so many patients came, you don't know what to do. Mm. Mm. Now I can remember they used to say some patients are so bad they can't survive with them alone. Right, right. Others are so wildly injured, look them after them afterwards. Yeah. And mm. middle category, take them to the theater and operate. Mm. Mm. The noise, uh, windows shook. At Chopati in my yeah. house, 44. And it was a huge thing, and gold bricks fell into Azad Maidan and things like that, you know. Because it was carrying uh, yeah. bullion. Yeah, it was uh, carrying bullion. And what we did as students, I was in the second year, carry stretchers. Really? See, uh, oh boy, how much can they do? And people started coming and injured people. And the surgeons were operating all night, cutting limbs, doing all kinds of things. They had put extra tables mm. and everybody was doing amputations. Really? Because the patients were so serious mm. and so many of them. Mm. So I did three amputations. Mm. And when I went to wash hands, to mm. there I found that there were heaps of extremities. Just limbs and limbs stacked up over them. And one bullet was in a, a, a patient's thigh and I removed the uh, bullet and kept it as a memoir. <laughs> <laughs> Our boy used to go to UK. Yes. For MRCP in London. Right. If they wanted to practice medicine. Right. Or a process in England. Right. If they wanted to practice surgery. Right. There was only two. They all ran that mm. and came back. The whole journey must have taken what? Twelve days. Twelve days. Yeah. Yeah. Faster than uh, going directly by sea hmm. um, uh, to Britain. But that took Britain. flights were not an option? No, there was an option. But In fact, when I went by boat, hmm. several of my colleagues who were going at the same time hmm. went by air. Hmm. And so, one of them persuaded me hmm. to carry a whole skeleton for study. <laughs> he packed it up in his, boat. In his um, whole the t tatty bag. And uh, some other things I had put inside, some other presents, like it is none of my, my things I had put in it. And by the time we reached London, it had lost. Oh. I don't know where it had gone. So yeah. I had reported it. I said, whoever finds the bones there, we wonder who was carrying this to. And luckily, about three or four months later, they discovered it and they delivered it to they us. They forwarded it. 1950. So just a little bit after World War II. Yeah. Definitely. What was London like at that time? London, like that at time, still in the rubbles, really? all over the place. Uh, it was ration for us. So uh, it wasn't a booming, prosperous no, city. No, 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 no. You couldn't get anything that you wanted. 
I didn't stay long. I rushed back to India. Uh-huh. Times were very difficult. Was mm-hmm. I landed? I had to go to the rest shop to the office there to get ration cards, right. books, and another some books for buying clothes and things really? like that, buying food, clothes, etc. Used to get one egg a week. Wow. No sugar, hardly any sugar. And time so very difficult. I reached Edinburgh about six thirty or so. Mm. So the landlady asked me whether they would like to have some tea. Mm. I said no, you know. I thought she is offering me tea. I will have dinner afterwards. So I took a sip of tea on a train. So I went to my small room, arranged my books, <laughs> and at eight thirty I stayed for my dinner. Everything was quiet at home. <laughs> she had gone to sleep. <laughs> And for the first time in my life, I went to sleep on an empty stomach. <laughs> and we stayed with the landlady. Really? We had hardly anything to eat. Really? Not much to eat. We mm. never went out to eat. We couldn't afford even, mm. and so on. And it was grim, dark. Mm. And I remember telling Surika, oh, "Where have we come? And why have we come here?" <laughs> from? And as I've written in my little something somewhere. That from my Mumbai of those days, with blue skies, white clouds, bungalows, to come to this dark, dingy place with rain all the time and cold. <laughs> I mean, it was a miserable experience landing up there. But once you started going to the courses mm. and you started learning little different medicine, mm. a different approach, you r- realized that it was worth the trip. And that obviously you're going to do the MRCP, which is what you come for. But England changed me a lot. In what sense? Not once a court was passed off my speech defect. Really? Not once. But so I mean, I would expect that nobody would comment. You mean in India, people were commenting? Really? Yes. In form of mischief, mm. mimicry. Teasing. Oh, really? Mimicry is even now at that time we went on. Really? That's very sad. But that's how we are. Our all jokes, if you ask me, mm. or you see any films, mm. they must have a stammerer, a man with a squint, mm. a man who is fat, or a man who is bald. Mm. Our all humor is limited to physical difference in life and mocking. Them. Mocking. In England, the humor was different type. Not one person on the face showed that was difficult with me. Yeah. So I think that's a good thing about this thing. I found they were generally very honest people. Mm. People would give a word; they keep their word. And I there, you see, we were three hundred who appeared. Right. Our two hundred got knocked out. First, in the in the clinical examination, two hundred out, hundred left. Right. So yeah. we hundred to, to go for path. Right. And by the time you reached the Viva Bosi at the Royal College, right, that was Viva Bosi. Another. We were forty, so sixty were knocked out. A lot of attrition. Now after three hundred, we were forty left. Mm. We were literally forty left, and you go ten ten each day. Mm. So I appeared in a set of ten, big hall. You know it. Mm. Now Royal, you went to Royal College. Love the atmosphere. Big libraries and big pictures and all the greats around you, and you're sitting there shivering, and. <laughs> Uh, there was a, I remember very well, a West Indian, very relaxed, with a jacket, lounging. He was reading a newspaper. So I said, "Aren't you worried?" Mm. He said, "Man, I have appeared twice before, and they knocked me out. This time <laughs> I've come to the final stage, so I'm not worried." And then you would go in turn by turn. There'd be a bell, mm. and the next boy has gone out from the other end. You don't know what's happened to him. Mm. And your turn comes, and if the bell rang quickly, either he failed, <laughs> or he had done so well that he passed. So anyway, my turn came in, and when my turn came in, I, I, I was palpitating. Hmm. That's the truth. And I said, if they ask me the dose of quinine, I won't know the dose of quinine. I don't know what they're going to ask me. I went in, and as luck would have it, the president of the Royal College was Russell Bray. Okay, wonderful. Who student I became? Later, and he was my hero. 
So there he was, and the four censors. And I sat down. I said, my God, what question is going to come? Then the chief censor got up. And you must have faced this, I suppose. I, can't, I did. I had a viva voce, but it wasn't as uh, austere. It was, it was very austere. He got up and said, um, Dr. Wadia's progress so far in the examination has been very satisfactory. We, did, we don't want to ask him any questions. <gasps> really? And I just jumped out of the chair. I said, oh, take it easy, take it easy. Well, congratulations. So no viva voce. Really? I, I obviously done very well in the earlier stages. And I think in the clinical uproar, I was told by one of the registrars who I met when I became a, a registrar myself, mm. that when you were at the bath, you got 100, five marks out of 120 or something in the clinical. Right. And that was, uh, ECGs were decently done. So no questions asked. So MRCP and, done. And I just stumbled out of the hall. There was the secretary waiting. This will be 50 pounds. <laughs> you know, <laughs> membership fee. And I said, ma'am, I have not brought my checkbook. I didn't expect to pass. Hmm. So I am not worth the 50 pounds. I will pay them to you whenever it is. But thank you very much. I am very happy that I have passed. And I just went down the stairs. And there was Baji Kolabala waiting down. Waiting because he was a surgeon. He was not in Edinburgh. Hmm. He was there waiting down there. And he said, Rashid, I have passed. Hmm. And they couldn't believe it. It was the first shot. How was the training at the children's hospital? Children's hospital also didn't have much in the way of training. Mm. But it was a large children's surgery department. Mm. <clears throat> so extensive uh, amount of work. Mm. For example, while I was there for the mm. next nine months, I spent nine months there. Mm. They were about to complete 500 cases of pyloxenosis operations. 500 cases? Without a death. That itself was amazing to me. Unfortunately, during my time, the 500th died. Oh, and so, that they didn't publish that paper. That was another amazing thing. That they didn't publish the paper because the 500th had died. Oh, really? Did you come back to visit family? No. Never. Not once? No, no, no. I, what? Where is the money? Seven years you were away? Yeah, seven years. And where is the money? We just... Mum came across. Hmm. <laughs> my mother came across. She was an old lady. Very nice. Not that old, of course, at that time. But she came across um, because my brother was in the United States to see if I was going to marry an English girl. Oh, she was worried about that. She was worried about that. I think she never <laughs> said that, but I knew why she was coming there. They asked me, the second day, why do you want to go back to India? Hmm. You are now only 30. Hmm. Good job. You get on this post one day. I said, for two reasons, I don't want to stay here. Hmm. He said, why? I said, now there is a fashion among the girls from the royal family <laughs> to, to marry commoners. I said, I can't take that risk. <laughs> so they used to laugh. But one more thing I said, but if to, to tomorrow, there is one more reason. If the Prime Minister or the Queen of England who operated, they will not call me. Mm. I am still an outsider. Mm. Second day, they are going to call you. Then India said, who knows? Mm. And I was called. Mm. Uh, that makes life very interesting, isn't that it? Phenomenal. There had his boy about four or five who had some problem with the umbilicus, mm. which I later realized was a very minor problem. Mm. But that boy had died, and nobody could tell me what killed him. Mm. And that was the sort of level mm. uh, we had in those it was days. Very basic. Yeah, and when I came back, mm. Dr. Arora, who was a pediatrician in the GT hospital and Bombay hospital, who used to edit the journal of Bombay Hospital, uh, said to me that the mortality of pyloric stenosis in Bombay is 25%. That also amazing okay. later on. Mm -hmm. But I realized that this, it was a big, big gap between what, what was being done and what could have been done. Every time I went for a house job, they said, you are MD, MRCP? This job is for MBBS. Sorry, no. I go for a registrar job, what have you done before? Where were you registered before this? I've never done registrarship. Mm. I was houseman, houseman, histology, and course. Mm. Well, you need to do a registrar job to get a registrar's job. And that's where I said, my God, what do I do now? Mm. 
And then luckily for me, there was an advertisement for a neurosurgeon in Newcastle, leaving London to go to Newcastle, who wanted house physicians to the neurosurgical unit. Obviously, they were not getting enough pair of hands. Mm. So I was physicians to the unit. So I applied and he saw the picture of the surgeon here, Robotham. Right. And I went there and he was too happy. He was going to get a houseman with MD MRCP. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I was six months job as a houseman. In Newcastle. And, and the two boys with me were MBBS from the Royal Victoria Infirmary. In Newcastle. In Newcastle. So the boss told me, look, you better look after them. Hmm. And just because you got all the degrees, don't you behave as if you are a registrar. You are a houseman. Hmm. Okay, sir. So I rolled up my sleeves and started doing a house job. Hmm. Within a couple of months, the registrar who was already doing neurosurgery and wanted to get along with his career said, no, she will look after the wards. I'll be in the theatre. And I said, please, no theatre for me. I don't want to come into the theatre. But again, I had the mortification of being pulled into the theatre. This is all true story, I've told you before. So they pulled me into the theatre just for a simple job. There, there was a big gap in the skull. Mm. And they wanted some bone chips. So they said, you just make a couple of bone chips from the iliac crest and give it to us. Mm. And Knowing me, I knew what would happen. I hit the thing and a big piece came out. <laughs> they just threw me out. Of the by that time, by the 1910, 1915, 1920, we had a whole body of consultants who had trained in JJ, who had gone abroad, most of them to England, and had come back with very high qualifications. The surgeons would come back with the fellowship of the Royal College of London. The physicians would come back with the membership of the Royal College of London. I mean, these were about the highest qualifications that you could aspire to in England. Right. And these people having come back were told you can't become a consultant in JJ. Really? So this was disappointing for them. Right. Here was Jawaharlal Nehru, here was Raja Gopalachari, Radha Krishna. Are a new nation coming up and we must go back. Coming back after England, mm. I realized most of them were very poor. Mm. Mm. Surgery on the whole was very poor. Mm. There were some bold surgeons mm. who did bold surgery, mm. but didn't think it was they doing good surgery or safe surgery. Mm. Mm. I was amazed to see the difference mm. in the quality of surgery mm. between then mm. uh, in Britain and here. Mm. Very soon afterwards, it changed because mm. several of our boys who went to Britain mm. and worked there. Mm and came back mm. and joined the uh, yeah, yeah. staff, mm. uh, it made a big difference. Mm. But I, I met, for example, one uh, obstetrician in the other mm. who told me that, no, no, we also do surgery in newborns. Mm. Dr. Pinto comes and does it here. Mm. You know, people, children live for four days afterwards. <laughs> so that is the sort of story. Four days. Yeah. Really, what do you say to the people? I was just stunned to hear this. Mm. But that was the state of affairs. Mm. And that's why I said I must specialize that this is a real speciality. There's and a real I'm, need. We were colonials. Mm. India was not free. Right. India became free 1947, 15 right. August. For Jawala Nehru called priest with destiny. Mm. I still remember his speech. Really? On the radio, huh? ah. there was no television then. And on the radio he said, at 12 o'clock at night, while the rest of the world is in deep slumbers, India will awake to its trees with destiny. The option was mine, and I had no doubt that I wanted to come back to India. Absolutely no, no second thought. And as I said last time when we were talking, the India of those days, was exhilarating. I mean, you had to listen to Jawaharlal Nehru, or you had to think of Vallabhai Patel, or any of the giants, of Maulana Azad, and said, my God, they are doing something. And what am I doing here in England? 
I'll be one more cog in the wheel, mm. which is what I would be. Nineteen forty-seven is a stellar uh, date for us because of independence. Was there anything in Grant Medical College that you remember which was associated yeah, well, with independence? Well, uh, I never took part in any of the activities of independence, but I was very interested. I was always watching everybody, and there were some very fine fellows, and one of them you are going to interview as Shanti Patel. People like him, Motala, who were firebrands. Really? From oh, the no, no, firebrands, absolute firebrands. Then they would take, tell the dean off. Really? That kind of boys. Mm. And uh, th that was allowed. That that freedom was allowed that you can tell the dean what you thought. I was a bold, alien man. I used to get bomb from Bombay. He used to have a group. About 10, 12 youngsters like me were there who were devoted and there was one Thakur Bhai Desai who became later on the deputy chief minister was our leader along with General Bhai Nair. And uh, there was a group who used to go at night and remove the stones from the fish plate and put the bomb there. Did JJ have any significant role to play in nationalist movements or in it? I think it, people like Dr. Shanti Patel were very uh, active and he even uh, confided in us when Asha and I went to interview him that uh, when we would call them terrorists today that they you know even tried to derail some trains and all that in <laughs> Gujarat you know that sort of stuff. When some students did um, go against the rulings passed by the government that you will not do this, you will not do this and these people did it. Deans like Shantilal Mehta generously overlooked all those. I mean they just turned a blind eye to all those activities and let them continue with their studies without rusticating them or really taking any of this. So in that sense there was a support. There was some sort of a uh, independence movement in JJ. In the strong process. one, yeah. very strong one. Where people uh -huh. used to say that this is a government college, so things like that. Mm. It's opposite. Mm. They, the, being inside the government, mm. they had the, more of the courage to, to do fight. Yeah. <laughs> Shanti Patel, I think. Yeah. Uh, and the, yeah. the greatest of them, of course, was Dr. Murgaukar. Mm. Dr. Murgaukar uh, was advised once Lord Raven mm. invited him for something mm. because he was not well. He's gone mm. to see him. And he didn't turn up in suits. Mm. So he got very upset that mm. uh, he's not wearing a suit. Mm. So he has asked him to be chucked out from JJ. Really? Yeah, so he was given an order. Mm. But the, all the students went on strike. Mm. I mean, they wouldn't come back mm. until he was reinstated. Re really. So What was Dr. Murbanka? So he was a senior surgeon. What is your impression about? The Grant Medical College doctor and student, what is so special about them that they do so well? And Grant Medical College and KM, they were always Mara Mari. Really? Mara Mari, not physical but otherwise. Huh. Who will do well in studies and who will do well in sports and so on. Right. We, JJ, we used to call ourselves, we have got a GMC spirit. Yes. I do not know if you heard about of it. Of course. Huh? And uh, they would ask, what is GMC spirit? I said, GMC spirit. We are independent, we think freely, we act boldly and we are what we are. Super. We are not, we are not what they call bookworms like KM people. <laughs> that was what we said. Huh? Yeah. They won't like it now, but I used to say that. Yeah. So used to, that huh? used to, we used to joke that KM people make good scholars, we make good doctors. Ah. You know, all the stuff we go about JJ and KEM, right. JJ and KEM, at the end of the day, it's a joke. Right. You know, nobody really is better or worse right. or anything like that for the institutions itself. But I think Tarpola actually did take it seriously. <laughs> and in his lectures with the undergraduates, he would refuse to let them mention the word KEM. He used to say, don't even talk about it. He said, call it the other place. Right. <laughs> so, that was the level to which he would carry this joke. Was there a lot of camaraderie if Grant Medical College was participating against the other colleges? Would everyone sort of troop off to cheer? And would yes, very much so. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, I remember uh, hearing about this the year before I joined, 50-51. Mm. Mm. There was a uh, football final between mm. Xavier's and Grant Medical College. Mm. And apparently, a large number of students from Grant Medical College mm. went to support their team. Mm. 
carrying bones, <laughs> fevers and numerous in the hand. And there used to be a, a inter-medical college dance competition, which uh, again, some of them took very seriously and they'd practice for weeks, jiving and waltzing and this and that. And I remember the second time we went, uh, there was all these teams and of course the JJ guys hadn't really prepared or weren't too serious <laughs> and they were doing something or the other. And the KEM guys, or was it the Nair guys, who had spent weeks practicing and, you know, were doing their sort of right movements and things. And one of the guys from my class was a guy called Jalil Parker, who is now uh, famous because he was Bala Sahib Thakre's doctor, yeah, who was full of fun and mischief. So he grabbed a board from somewhere or the other, pretended to be one of the judges and you'd go to all these couples that were dancing and look at them very formally and look at their steps, etc. and dismiss them and say that, no, not good enough, you please leave. So he dismissed about half the KM guys and half the Nair guys. I still, you can say, say that KM is a school, not college. 